Hello, um, good evening everyone. It's so wonderful to see so many names um, familiar and new names to me in the chat. Uh, so welcome to tonight's event, Mothering Professionals, Black Mother Disengagement, Advocacy and Agency with Prof Professor Jacqueline Getfield. My name is Eliza Chandler and my pronouns are she and her. And I'm an assistant professor in the School of Disability Studies. I'm a noticeably disabled, white, cisgendered woman with short, dark hair, black glasses. I'm wearing headphones. Sorry, I thought I was muted. Okay, I'm wearing headphones and um, a dark top with a silver necklace. As we gather here tonight to listen to and engage with uh, Professor Getfield as she shares her thinking um, and we reflect on and learn from her perspectives and engage in critical dialogue, we acknowledge that the School of Disability Studies is on Treaty 13 territory, a treaty that was established by the Mississauga of the Credit River and the British Crown. We are surrounded by Treaty 13A and Treaty 20, which is also known as the Williams Treaty and Treaty 19. I speak to you um, today from a city that is currently called Toronto at a university which, which is in Toronto and both are located in the District 1 Spoon Territory, which is a treaty between the Haudenosaunee Coventry and the Anishinaabek, including allied nations, to, um, to peacefully share and protect the resources around the Great Lakes. As always, the purpose of land acknowledgement is to help us pause and recognize the territory we're on. And so if you find yourself other, somewhere other than Toronto or Tegaranto right now, I hope you are able to acknowledge where you are and to acknowledge both the history and present of Indigenous communities in the place that you call home. Feel free to enter this enter um, the, the um, territory on which you, you're located in the chat if, if you would like. Those of us who are not Indigenous have arrived as settlers on Indigenous territory in different ways, and we acknowledge that some of, our some of our ancestors and elders were forcibly displaced people brought here involuntarily um, or by force, particularly those who were brought here as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. So I would like to welcome you on behalf of the School of Disability Studies, particularly um, my colleagues who are here with me tonight, um, Dr. Esther Ignani, a Paris Master McBray, Dr. Adil Abdullahi, Lauren Monroe, Dr. Ricky Bargase, Dr. Adin Jarrett Poole, Tali Ternoski, and Hannah Edwards. I also want to extend a warm welcome to the DSD students who are in, in the audience. The School of Disability Studies is providing internationally renowned teaching and research in critical disability and math studies for over 20 years. As a part-time undergraduate program, degree completion program, we are privileged to engage with primarily working students whose live, lives intersect with disability, madness, and deafhood as workers, family members, or through direct lived experience. Um, a note here, um, for tonight, the school has just posted uh, calls for applications for two, po two postdoctoral fellows, the Ethel Louise Armstrong Postdoctoral Fellowship and the Tennis Doe Postdoctoral Fellowship. Um, you can find postings for both postdoctoral fellowships on the X University career website, and I'll also post the links in the chat. Any of us in the School of Disability Studies, including um, the current postdocs, would be happy to talk to you about these positions 
and answer any questions that you might have. So those are the postings for those. So our university, X University, has been has, in, has been engaging in a renewed commitment to decolonization, guided by a few specific reports. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I posted that in the wrong chat. I'll post it in the right chat now. Apologies. So our university, X University, has a renewed commitment to decolonization, which is guided by a few reports such as the Anti-Black Racism Campus Climate Report, which was delivered in the summer of 2020, which details how Black students, faculty, and staff are impacted by white supremacy and experience anti-Black racism on our campus. And also by the Standing Strong Task Force, which was delivered last summer, which articulates our um, how our current namesake for our university, Eckerson Ryerson, or ER, how his influence over the design and implementation of the residential school system in Canada and the special education school system in Ontario continues to shape the delivery and the content of our curriculum as offered in our university. This report recommends a series of actions towards decolonization, including, as you all likely know, a university name change, but also it guides us towards asking critical questions about how, how colonialism shapes our university, its research, and um, the, the student and educational experiences that are possible. I know Professor Getfield will speak to some of these issues in her talk raising related critical questions about normative expectations in education. The event that you are attending tonight is the final event in the School of Disability Studies for, um, um, speaker series titled Perspectives, a Black Disability, Mad and Deaf speaker series, which has been taken, taken which is, began in August and ends, ends tonight. The series is funded by uh, um, an F a Faculty of Community Services Anti-Black Racism Curriculum Fund, and we are grateful for this report. This support. Um, the speaker series has um, has featured a series of three online discussions. The first one um, featured Black Deaf in Canada Collective, um, featuring Dr. Janelle Roos. Nuar Abd Abdul and Abigail Dequish. Um, that was our first event. Our second event was a private interview with Imani Barbary, conducted by Fiona Watson and Tai Hoot, who are members of the school's um, Anti-Black Racism, Racism Committee. And we are so pleased to be able to close this series with a talk from Pro Professor Getfield. We've been recording all of these discussions and we will turn them into web webinars that will be used in our classes, DSD classes. And this pro this project is an ongoing is part of an ongoing effort to strengthen and make more predominant um, uh, black, black disability, mad and deaf studies and perspectives across the DSD curriculum. We've talked, of, I raise this um, here because um, we've talked with Professor Getfield quite a bit about the context in which he's speaking, which is of course to all of you here tonight, but in perpetuity to DST students as we will share parts of this recording in, in our classes for years to come. Uh, Professor Getfield knows our students, she's taught in our courses, um, and so we've asked her to pitch her remarks um, with, with this con context in mind tonight. And I can say um, that many of our students, that, that many of our students, many of whom are educational assistants, disabled parents, and parents of disabled children, are very interested and excited for this talk. So um, in terms of access, and then I'll move to introducing Professor Getfield. Our access tonight is supported by FCS, 
who continues to provide access, allowing our sorry, who continues to support access, allowing our school to continue our work with disability, deaf, mad, and neurodiverse communities. Tonight we have ASL interpretation from Mel Sear and uh, Roman Pizzicello. Kella, um, Angie Lang will be providing the live captions. If you'd like to see our live captions, please click the CC button. If you have any access questions or concerns, um, either now or as, as the evening carries on, please feel free to direct message the host and panelists and we, and we will respond. Um, and please note that the chat is automatically set to hosts and panelists. So if you'd like to chat with a larger group, please make sure you select everyone by the two button. I've just also posted my email address in the chat. If you would like to ask a question or um, express an access need, but you would not like to use the chat or the Q&A function, please feel free to email me. On the subject of um, Q&A, we do ask you to please write your questions for Pro Professor Getfield in the Q&A function um, and not the regular chat. Um, and you can do this anytime throughout the talk. We will gather these questions um, from the Q&A function and Tai Hoot, who you'll meet after the talk, who's facilitating during the discussion, will pose these questions to Professor Getfield. So please only use the chat function for things like salutations and general comments, as we will not be keeping track of any questions that are posted in the general chat. So again, questions should go to my email or the Q&A function and, and we'll collect them. Um, okay, so, so that's that. So, so without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening. Um, this has been a, a sort of joy to plan, a joy to get ready, and a joy to be in touch with Professor Getfield for these last couple of months. Um, Professor Getfield's intersectional work on mothering slash othering is mediated through disability, race, class, and gender. Jackie analyzes mothering work within the community and in early childhood education through K to 12 educational spaces. She integrates and she interrogates and unpacks the real material work that mothers and other mothers must do as agents and advocates on behalf of children who are enrolled in special education and in the public school, sorry, in the public school system in Ontario. Jackie Getfield is a PhD candidate in the Department of Social Justice Education and OISE at the University of Toronto. She is a fierce advocate on behalf of her school-aged twin sons. Currently, Jackie volunteers as a board member on the Ontario National Alliance of Black School Educators. She assists parents in developing their advocacy skills and regularly consults with educators, administrators, and health professionals at schools and district school board levels. So, um, welcome to our esteemed colleague, Jackie Getfield. So, Jackie will speak for about 45 minutes, and then, as I mentioned, we will have a facilitated um, conversation facilitated by Tai Hoot for the remainder of our time. So please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Jackie Getfield. Eliza, and thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for inviting me to speak about my work. And I am just delighted to be able to share um, the othering of Black mothers. So I'll begin. Black women and or children know the fabric of our lives is stitched with violence and with hatred, that there is no rest. We do not deal with it only on the picket lines or in the dark midnight alleys or in the places where we dare to verbalize 
or resistance for us. Increasingly, violence weaves through the daily tissues of our living, in the supermarket, in the classroom, in the elevator, in the clinic and the schoolyard, from the plumber, the baker, the saleswoman, the bus driver, the bank teller, the waitress who does not serve us. Some problems we share as women and some we do not. You fear your children will grow up to join the patriarchy and testify against you. We fear our children will be dragged from a car and shot down in the street and you will turn your backs upon the reasons they are dying. The concept and practice of Black mothering signal action and identity portraits that are unique to Black lived experiences. And so it is that I chose to begin this public lecture with an excerpt from Audre Lorde's 1984 work titled Sister Outsider. I continue to quote Audrey verbatim, just a little bit more. She says, unless one lives and loves in the trenches, it is difficult to remember that the war against dehumanization is ceaseless, close quote. It may seem to some of you that I began with what may appear to be gender issues since Audre Lorde is speaking directly to white women. She's sharing black women's everyday real life experiences. But clearly this is more than just gender issues. This is about race as well as class. There are a few things that stand out for me. As Lorde says, what matters most is the ceaseless war against dehumanization the making of the subhuman, the person who is thought to be less than human, the fear of our children, black children being killed and knowing that although we are all mothers, black, white, racialized, indigenous, some mothers because of ethno-racial and cultural or class reasons, they just don't seem to care about the reasons why black children are dying. So Lord says, and I quote, you will turn your backs upon the reasons they are dying. Let me just underscore the word reasons. This is a call to action. This talk is about us responding to the reasons that black children are dying. Spirits murdered, as well as being physically abused, harmed, all of it. Death of self, death of, death of spirit. Black women and our children meet with violence of indifference and live with violence of disregard every day. So I resonate with Lord's writing because it often feels as though there is no rest, as she says. These quotes from Lord are heavy. They are heavy laden in multiple ways. So let's get on the same page so we can understand each other. This public lecture is focused on my concepts and theories chapter in my doctoral work. But before I get into the concepts, let me introduce myself. This is important because explaining my positionality will provide you with details of my ontological and epistemological approaches to my research. This means that I'm gonna tell you what I understand, the meanings I make of the phenomena on the study, and how, meaning the reasons and sources of my understanding, how I have come to understand that which I understand. So I'll tell you about myself now. A Jamaica, my barn and a Kingston, me grow. Sunday glisten and cool breeze, they blow. There is no snow but I revives a flow. So come, make we sit and reason. After all, it's mango season. Paul Bogle, Sam Sharp, Norman Manley, Buster Manti, and the woman leader, woman nanny. But the look there, the cane feel a bone. People, people, wake up, look up. 
Rise up, you mighty race, Marcus Garvey. Third world leader, Michael Manley, and Dado Trudeau on the first world stage. Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States and the New International Economic Order. Free education for poor people, pick me. Everybody must learn to read, improve your literacy. House ownership, push your own key, NHT. Be who you want to be, free. But free from whom and free from what? Ontario is the place to go. Ontario is the place to grow. Same time, two pick the drop, drop. Lord God, what is this? What is that? It is a process. The teacher them a walk to give me work. Meetings with the teacher. Wait. I'm told I must wait. Meetings with the principal team. Wait. I'm told we must wait. Meetings with the superintendent and the associate director. The direction is for all of us to wait. It is a process. But wait, time now, wait. Who the wait for the poor people pick me? The black pick me? The indigenous pick me them? Discipline, failing, falling, being pushed out, and yet, but still, we wait. Let's conduct research. Let's ruminate, contemplate, communicate. Mm, let's procrastinate. Why the fear? Why the hate? And still, we wait. Through this poem, I have explicated the concept of positionality. For more about language and resistance, check out Gloria and Zaldua's work, as well as the Right Honorable Louise Bennett Covelli's work. And then you can check out some critical race theorists who project resistance through the use of language. Powerful stuff. Positionality refers to my social background and therefore my beliefs and my opinions. All these influence how I gather information and how I ask questions or don't ask questions, as well as how I analyze the raw data and present my findings. As editor, I have the power to keep some things and reject others. But make no mistake, my arguments and my claims are therefore not neutral, but very political. In this short form, you may have learned a lot about me. But did you? Did you though? Do you think you understand me more now that I've told you more about myself in my own words? Did you connect with anything that I said? Did anything resonate? What about CERDs and the NIEO, which were international agreements in 1974? Why Manley? Why Pierre Trudeau? Why Mumanani of the Maroons? If I were a parent of a child or children in your class, let's say, or in your care within the health setting, would knowing anything about me, hearing anything that I just mentioned in the point, would any of those make a difference in how you relate with me or speak with me? Charlie's gonna put some of these questions in the Q&A and you can, and so if you want, or maybe pose other questions for me. For those of you just joining us, the public lecture is based on my doctoral research and it's titled Mothering Professionals, Black Mother Disengagement, Advocacy and Agency. So what's going on? What exactly is happening in my research? Well, first thing is that it's fueled by critical race theory, critical disability studies, as well as a few feminist ideologies, because the aim of my studies, study is to document the realities and perspectives of seven Black mothers, including me. My doctoral work displays the many faceted ways in which Black women contribute to the analysis of homeschool relations. 
specifically my work is focused on disrupting the traditional family engagement and parent, parental involvement discourse. So not only do I examine the gendered nature of mothering, but I also look at mother work through race, class, and disability. I look at power, I look at domination, I look at the dominant culture versus racialized uh, mothers. My research was constrained by scope and time because as you all know, the longest prayer must have an amen. So all good things must come to an end. In my doctoral work, I conduct in-depth interviews of six black mothers and I read in my own counter narratives and I analyze the content using critical race methodology and critical po policy analysis. So today I will talk mostly about the theories and concepts chapter. And then you'll understand more about, you know, how I position my work. I do this by applying my favorite analytical word and it's how. How has it come to be so? How do black mothers experience homeschool relations post 2014? How do they describe their own experiences and their interactions with educators? And by educators, I mean teachers and administrators. Who are these black mothers? Well, to answer this question, we turn to concepts of mainstream narratives and counter narratives that will help us to understand how black mothers have been socially constructed. To understand black mothers from a critical race theory perspective, from a disability identity perspective, and from a black feminist perspective, let us consider the concept of intersectionality. As critical theorists, we view ourselves and the world through an intersectional lens. This means that we lean upon Kimberly Crenshaw's 1989 groundbreaking work that was originally focused on understanding how black women were socially constructed and therefore understanding the lived experiences of black women. Intersectionality forces us to step outside of our individual pre-understandings and knowings in order to understand those in our society who have been othered, especially those who are on the periphery of society, those who inhabit the global south, those who live in less powerful nation states. We will consider the confluence of identities or social locations. So what do I mean by being othered? Well, white women are the privileged other with a capital O, while non-racialized women are marked as, well, I should say racialized women are marked as different, set apart, a subset of women. Non-white women, therefore, are called other others, or, or simply um, thought of as just lowercase o, other. For more on that, you can look at um, Melinda Smith's work and, um, Funke JP, who touches briefly up on it um, in her most recent publication. The flip side of intersectionality is essentialism. When we essentialize, we believe that all people within a particular group think and act the same, or that each member within that group believes the same things. Nothing could be farther from the truth. And so whether you are in education or health, or social work or psychology, I urge you to clear your minds of what you think you know about your families and talk with them, listen to them. Let them tell you about their children and themselves. But don't interrogate them though. Think healthy relations. Remember, there is no one essential story. So if you seek an understanding of the black mother, as though there is only one type of black mother, then you will find yourself embracing stereotypes and tropes and engaging through misunderstandings. Not good. In my doctoral work, while all the women identified as black mothers, each woman had different ways of mothering and each also had different ways of acting as agents on behalf of the children who were enrolled in special education classrooms in the GTA. So mothers in my study have been described as being middle-class, low-income, middle-aged, Jamaicans or of Jamaican descent, citizens of Canada, residents of Ontario, 
stay at home mom, part-time professional, full-time professionals. And then there is me, the researcher participant, the insider outsider. So far, have you been thinking about your own construction? Like how would you construct these mothers? What, in other words, what's your perception of black mothers? One more thing. Most of these mothers are transnational beings. Transnationalism, according to Yuval Davis' 2009 work, is the blurring of national boundaries such that social activities and institutions move more freely and have significance across nations. What does it mean to live in a global world or to be transnational? Well, it means that for some black mothers, their relatives and extended families are often elsewhere. They don't have ready support. As opposed to their counterparts in the global north, until these mothers establish a community in the global north, transnational mothers from the global south must travel or use social media to connect with friends and family back home. Any study of black mothers generally then should prompt us to pause and reflect on interlocking oppressions, including nationality and citizenship. So for the mothers in this study, transnationalism affects them in different ways. So they are point, their points of departure, meaning how they begin to think through their own experiences will be influenced by their positioning. Plus, each Black mother's engagement will look different based on how the Black mother perceives the needs of her children. Again, there is no one disability story. There are diverse accounts of Black mother engagement. Yet, there are similarities and commonalities among Black mother experiences within homeschool relations in Ontario. Still yet, there will always be differences and disparities. Some children may require greater parental intervention in school because of what the educator perceive officially as quote unquote behaviors, while others may require their mothers to be relentless advocates so they can thrive despite the well-intentioned yet discriminatory and prejudicial racist and ableist practices of educators. Still, other students need their parents to exercise the agential power bestowed by the education system in Ontario so that the students can obtain resources and therefore increase academic access to the Ontario curriculum. Children's impairments and the disabling conditions in their classrooms differ. And just as with race, disability must be analyzed with intersectional oppressions due to race, sex, gender, nationality, class, age, citizenship, et cetera, et cetera. So give me a few minutes to talk about my approach to the study of the doing of disability. Some disability studies scholars analyze along the lines of the social model, and so prefer not to engage with the medical or clinical at all. While other disability studies scholars have been contextualizing the vast range of impairment etiology. Some disability, disability scholars have not only expanded disability studies through critical race, feminist, cultural, and phenomenological theories, among other social theories, but they have also zeroed in on the perspectives of the global South. Through a critical disability studies lens, Mikosha and Shuttleworth 2016 work they assert that disability, and I open quote, disability is a conceptual category that can be applied to the bodies and minds of people, close quote. So these authors urge us to consider the social, economic, and political, as well as the psychological and the cultural. Previously, under the umbrella of traditional disability studies, the psychological and psychoanalytic would have been stigmatized as reinforcing an individual model of disability. Nikosha and Shuttleworth explained that this is no longer the case. And I'm right there with them and with Bailey and Mobley's in their 2019 work. My approach to research is based on what the French call bricolage. Yes, I'm a Jamaican speaking French now. 
a qualitative researcher, I may be considered a bricoleur. As the term bricolage implies in my work, I layer theories and concepts to understand and examine the phenomena that I am studying. So no one theory can explain the phenomenon of black mothers engagement in schools. There are multiple concepts to be unpacked. No one issue, no one access. So critical race theory is the primary lens through which I analyze life as we know it. Gloria Ladson Billing in one of her most recent publications, and this one is titled um, Critical Race Theory in Education, a Scholar's Journey. She encourages us to look at all identity status categories as operating simultaneously. So she ex extends this thought by saying, and I open quote, critical race theory is willing to engage in the messiness of life, close quote. When it comes to my two children's education and schooling, I believe at a minimum, race, class, gender, and ability, all four, are working simultaneously. I don't know which social categories will be the basis on which my children are embraced or disregarded by their teachers and support workers. I really don't know. And I found the same to be true of my mother's treatment during the last days of her intense sickness in the hospital. There was a time when the hospital staff refused to treat her. They complained that she was persistently non-compliant. She was too weak, in my opinion, and too sick to be uncooperative. Her counter story, my mother's counter story, is that the hospital staff complained that she was not doing as they asked. And she said they were rough and aggressive in their treatment of her. And for some reason, they seemed frustrated and very short-tempered. Literally, she said she could not understand what they were saying. They claimed they could not understand what she was saying. And I know that she spoke English. Peremptorily, they refused to offer her the doctor mandated required services. At that time, my mother was a very sick, frail, elderly, bossy, confident, eight-year-old that woman. So you better know how you approach her. But let us unpack this a bit. How did we as a society arrive at a place where children and, elder, and an elderly woman could be refused services by caring, well-intentioned professionals? I posit Nikosha's 2011 um, work. Um, one quote that says, race and disability in the global south are fluid concepts. This has been the case both in colonial and contemporary times. We cannot meaningfully separate the racialized subaltern from the disabled subaltern in the process of colonization. Fast forward to the present. Fast forward, well, let us move into the global north. Race and disability are fluid moving constructs in that the meanings are not fixed, but meaning is made and manifested in and through interaction one with the other. This is true regardless of geopolitical context. Meanings take shape and are themselves reshaped depending on the cultural context within each nation state and if we drill down deeper within each ethnic region. So in Canada as well, there are racial prejudices and discrimination on the basis of ability between and among marginalized groups. We cannot analyze along the lines of disability and race without talking about colonization though. Yes, I am hearing you groan, but we're gonna do it. Mikosha's quote has prompted me to start with this. Some 400 odd years ago, enslaved Africans were being transported to the Caribbean and to the USA as property owned by white people. 
property to be owned by white people. It was all about money and profits. Some bodies had to work the plantations and it would not be the white bodies. Does this mean that critical race theory is about the black slash white binary? No, not at all. Each group of peoples, each community has unique histories and experiences that have been shaped by racism and interlocking oppressions. Through critical race theory, we move beyond the black slash white binary, which limits the many ways that all these groups experience, make meaning of, and ultimately resist racism and other forms of oppression. I invite you to check out Tara Yoso's 2005 work for more on this. In my own work, I have embraced and interpreted critical race theorist tenets or core principles as follows. And since I know most persons um, are familiar with critical race tenets, I won't go into full detail just to, just to touch on them. Racism is normal. It is the only way society does business. The common everyday experience of most people of color. This is from Delgado and Stefan Schick, 2001, page seven. Critical race theory, another core principle, Ill core principle is that there is interest, interest convergence. Derek Bell in his 1980 work, as cited in Laura Ladson Billings 2021 publication, posits that white people will seek racial justice only to the extent that there is something in it for them. Interest convergence therefore is about alignment of interests. It's not about benevolence and it's not about charity. Another core principle is race as a social construction. So race is not biological, it's not scientific. Gloria Latson Billing in the 2021 publication says, open quote, humans have constructed social categories and organization that rely heavily on arbitrary genetic differences like skin color, hair texture, eye shape, and lip size, close quote. Gloria Ladson Billing goes on to explain that these are all phenotypical features, but we are all biologically similar within the same species, much the same as cats, regardless of how they appear, they're still cats, whether they have long hair, short hair, whether they are black or blonde haired or, you know, um, rust colored, spotted, you know, with spots, doesn't matter all cats. Same thing for fish, same thing for birds. Another core principle is intersectionality, which we spoke about before, so I won't go into that right now. And storytelling is the last one. Storytelling, counter narratives, and voice. There are stories told by the dominant culture, and these are what usually feed into policy. These are what inform um, master legislation like the Education Act. These are what make up the official historically, historical accounts that we learn you know, as students in school. This is the basis of legislation. These are what we call the dominant stories. They are made, they are produced by the more powerful, the more important, the more significant among us, as society would like us to believe. From a critical race theory perspective, we must examine or understand how these stories influence law and policy and work, do the actual work, the doing of these stories in our daily lives. Then of course, there are counter narratives. And these are told, these are produced and reproduced by the less powerful and the less important those who have been relocated or located on the periphery. So let me read a little bit more about um, from Nicosia's 20, 2011 work. She says, in colonial times, both disabled and racialized individuals were institutionalized to contain resistance and to prevent pollution, to prevent pollution of the wider population. 
what does Mikosha mean by pollution of the wider population? Well, let's start with the uh, Black segregated schools. After British slavery ended, many white Canadians reacted negatively to the settlement of Blacks in their communities. I'm reading from McLaren's 2004 work now. So these white Canadians were often refusing Black students entry into public schools. The School Act of 1850, however, permitted segregated schools for Blacks. Local school officials based their refusal on arguments focusing on the perceived superiority of the white race and the potential threat that allowing Black students into the classroom may have on other students, particularly girls. The vehement opposition to allowing Blacks in public schools existed in many communities despite a legal prohibition on discrimination due to race, religion, or language, said McLaren. I invite you to go online to find out more. I believe the McLaren 2004 is online and find out more from Natasha Henry's work. Um, you know, read about the ridiculous ways some white parents thought that black students would contaminate their children and make them less smart. Read about how Superintendent Egerton Ryerson, after whom Ryerson University was named, how he said that his hands were tied and he had to do the will of the people. Of course, black parents were not thought to be numbered among the people. Egerton Ryerson was talking about the majority voters, property owners, land owners white people. Of course, black parents, including black mothers and black teachers fought back. We have been fighting this fight against a white system of education long before 1850. And it continues to this day. For more on the work of black educators, black teachers, specifically black female teachers, check out Schooling the System um, by Funke Alleged Deby and Rosalind Hampton's Black Racialization and Resistance at an Elite University. Check out those books. Those are the most recent, I believe, in my opinion, if you want to understand Blackness, the Ontario school system, racialization and racism. And if funds are running low, Check out Karen Robson's work on sociology in education that you can find online. The book is free. So the containment and segregation of black children continues today. Still the system of education is designed even today with the normal, quote unquote, normal or neurotypical in mind. Today, students are placed in regular, partially integrated or segregated classrooms. Special education classrooms are used to contain some children. As we all may recall previously, madhouses and the sanatorium were the institutions used to contain those deemed to be mentally ill or lunatics. And prisons have been used and still are being used to contain resistance to power structures, to issue warnings and so prevent pollution of the wider population. So why did I give you all this background? Does this mean that vestiges of colonial thinking remain in our societies today? What do we do when members of our society today resist the law, don't obey the rules, and don't act according to normalized expectations? Yeah, you got it. We contain them. So to expand on this, or maybe to clarify, Day and Wambui, in their 2021 publication, explain how containment and segregation continues today in the classroom. Racialized, open quote, racialized students, particularly black and indigenous students are overwhelmingly streamed into special needs programs based on unfounded assumptions about their ability to achieve academically. The Anwam Bui go on to say, 
White students, on the other hand, are largely streamed into gifted or academic programs. Once again, based on unfounded assumptions about their academic ability. They say standardized testing perpetuates racial differential outcomes in education achievement. Standardized testing has eugenic origins. IQ testing from which standardized testing is devised was originally a method touted by eugenicists to, open quote, identify, segregate, and serialize the feeble-minded. And ready 2000 white. 2008 work was cited there. So inevitably, the feeble-minded were found to be disproportionately non-white people, given that the tests relied heavily on elite and urban pop culture. There ends Day and One Bowie's quote. So now we have to talk about eugenics. We, we just have to. What was the basis of this will of the people to which Egerton Ryerson surrendered in the 1800s? How and why did the will of the people, how did the public discourse, how did the popular sentiment come to reproduce racist and ableist thinking? Well, for centuries, not just in recent decades, white leaders have sought to close North American borders to incoming black and racialized peoples. In fact, they have sought to close the borders to even persons from Ireland. Disabled people were denied entry. Eugenics is a scientific justification for a pure white race. In contrast, racialized persons were deemed undesirable, unfit, and inferior. Eugenics called for the institutionalization of the unfit racialized person disabled persons, those who were unfit to work and therefore a burden to society. Eugenics sanctioned by the state encouraged selective breeding. For example, the involuntary sterilization of non-white women, indigenous women. It encouraged racial segregation on reservations. Of course, it goes without saying that those who advocated for eugenics were well-intentioned. Eugenics seemed to be common sense because the intent was to breed out of society everything that was abnormal and deviant, including crime, mental illness, and poverty. Can't you imagine the tagline back in the day? Eugenics, because we care. Not funny. So let us bring it all together. Anti-blackness, colonialism, eugenics, and stigma. To do this, I will lean heavily on Bailey and Mobley's 2019 work on disability feminist, dis black feminist disability framework. So eugenics disallowed black intelligence. Blackness was tied to lack and dehumanization. Bailey and Mobley in their 2019 work posit, open quote, Race marks black people as being inherently disabled, fundamentally other. In this way, race and disability are mutually constitutive. Close quote. So I want us to consider that it is never one thing or another for racialized and black people. It is everything all the time. It was Audre Lorde in her 1984 work that says, there is no one such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So I'm just gonna touch briefly upon stigma. Bailey and Mobley says that stigma further complicates acknowledging disability as it already places an already precarious self at further risk of marginalization and vulnerability to state and medical violence, incarceration and economic exploitation. For a lot of black mothers who are agents on behalf of their children in the special education environment in public schools in Ontario, 
they think, you know, they feel like it's damned if you do and damned if you don't. They know their children need services, but they're afraid to get them labeled and diagnosed because they know what happens when you diagnose a black child or any child for that matter, but especially black children. The numbers show it. Disproportionately black children are, are you know, they, they present as a greater number of kids who are being disciplined, experiencing harm in special education environments greater numbers of them in special education environments. So mothers know that they have to fight. Once you assume that label and that, that, that diagnosis, the fight is on. You know, the system calls it advocacy, but it's really a fight. It is interesting that to get services for the kids, educators have to say, yes, it is true. Yet so there's a whole cadre of health professionals waiting to help kids who may not have been sanctioned as, you know, um, significantly disabled. And so their teachers won't necessarily refer them for services. At the same time, there are some who get, re reserved, re re get referred for services without having significant dis disabilities. And that's usually to get those outside of the classroom. Those are the troublemakers. So, you know, it is an interesting way of engagement. The Ministry of Education um, expects that uh, educators will lead in the building of partnerships with parents. But here is where it's falling apart. Some educators are not always welcoming, even when they appear to be welcoming. They give a lot of meeting time, for which they are paid handsomely. But the question is, what happens after the meetings? One mother in my study had to homeschool her child for two weeks while she went through a slew of meetings during which time she had to make her case and prove that a teacher was treating her child prejudicially. That he was black and had a learning disability were both beside the point and exactly the point. The child was afraid of his teacher. She called him derogatory names. She spoke to him disparagingly. She rarely gave him feedback on his classwork. And when she did, well, she was punitive. Eventually, the district school board moved him to another school. Mothers in my doctoral study report that they have had multiple meetings each semester with educators. Since September 21, I myself, I had no less than 45 online and telephone meetings with varying levels of local school and district school board personnel about my two children's education. I'm not exaggerating. The calls and the meetings were so frequent for another mother in my study that she told an administrator to finish doing his job, do his investigations and figure things out by himself before he calls her. She has had to explain to this administrator with whom she continues to have a good relationship, by the way, that when he has not yet completed his investigation and when he calls her prematurely to talk about her son's behavior, in incidents that involved other students, including white students, then this tells her that her son is being treated prejudicially based upon his race. It is also subjective, right? That, that which is perceived as behaviors by some teachers are perceived as being boys being boys by other teachers. Studies have shown that punishment deemed seem to depend on race and class, race and class of the boy, race and class of the educator. Another mother in my study explained that the teachers keep complaining of her child's behavior, but yet the educators refused to develop an IEP for this child so that he could receive supports and services from the school. Even though they have documentation from the doctor that says, this child needs services from the school. Instead, 
the educators would often suspend him for a day here, half a day there. And of course, his mother had to stop from work each time. And this boy loved missing school. He was five, maybe six years old at the time. The impact of punishment was lost on this child, but rather impactful for the mother. Let me just say it clearly. Black mothers in the study did not have any interest in policies or legislation that governed educators' actions. They were clear that they have never read them and that they were not going to read these policies. Forget the Education Act. They knew the educators were backed by policies and this master legislation, but there, was, there seemed to be no real accountability, according to these mothers. Educators seem to be able to do much at their own discretion, regardless of the policy mandates. For example, some mothers reported that educators would meet without them, yet the policy claims that there is a partnership between home and school. One black mother explained that she had to insist that the educators should not hold the IPRC without her. That same black mother showed me iterative copies of her child's IEP with other children's name and details about other children written in them. In the team meeting, it was explained by the superintendent that this may have been because of a drop down box issue. And they left it at that. Black mothers in my doctoral work had concerns about their children's academic performance. At least four mothers were distraught about the barriers that they face in accessing their children's classwork in elementary public school. They were denied access to the feedback that teachers said that they gave to students. This was a huge problem for these mothers because they needed to access their children's work and the teacher's feedback in order to help their children. These mothers know what kind of exceptionalities um, were affecting their children or impacting their children, they know. They also knew who had power and who were the ones that could dominate. They knew that it wasn't them, not the black mothers. But you'd ask yourself, wouldn't it be in the best interest of all educators to ensure that parents receive classwork samples, especially when they request them? But shouldn't all students receive feedback on their classwork and formal assessments that clearly and adequately communicate their progress or the lack thereof? So these students would know how to improve, build their skills, etc. Jacquard said a world no level and a true. Black mothers reported that they're they were either being silenced and ignored by educators or they were choosing to self-censor themselves for fear of educator reprisals. Member of organizations, members of organizations, such as the black, the parents of parents of black children, and Onapsi explain that in virtual school, black parents are able to see what is going on in the class. While the popular narrative is that kids must go to the physical school building because they need socialization to prevent mental health issues mental ill health issues, some black students are said to be thriving during the pandemic, during the pandemic because they are not being subjected to in-school microaggressions, institutional racism and individual racism normally perpetuated against black students by peers and educators in the public school on occasion. And yes, the pandemic has revealed cracks and fissures in the inequitable educational structure in Ontario and across Canada. It has shown how black students have been dehumanized and made to be invisible in classrooms. But guess what? The pandemic has also shown that when teachers and students are under surveillance, then black mothers can see for themselves what is happening in the classrooms and we can better equip ourselves to perform the necessary repair we can repair the damage done to our children in the public school system. Let me just quickly go on to a personal note and I'm just about to wrap up in about maybe, maybe can I have five more minutes? 
On a personal note, during the pandemic, I myself witnessed a school board consultant ignoring my two children for an entire 60 minute period. This person told them at the end of the session that the teacher will teach them the next day. And I had to ask myself, what is it about my two or any black disabled children that would tell a consulting teacher that that was okay? How did these adults expect my children to feel about themselves? And, and why would they deny my children access to their education? You know, the Ontario Human Rights website cites a 20 year old report that showed that black students were significantly more likely than South Asian students, um, Asian students, white students, or any other racial minority students to perceive that teachers at the school treated them differently, much worse. That was 20 years ago. In 2017, Another TDSB um, study found that almost 48% of the board's expelled students were black. James and Turner in their 2017 work, which is of course one of the most comprehensive and most current compilation that speaks to the ongoing persistent issues pertaining to the disregard of black students in educational spaces. James and Turner, you got to read out. I don't have much time, so I'll quick, I'm quickly trying to scan and move forward. So let me be frank as I close in the interest of time. I really want to hear from you, so I'm gonna close it soon. I don't know who the leaders of education in Ontario, you know, think they're trying to fool. The writing has been on the wall. There are countless reports, you know, research documents, Shelves are creaking under the weight of scholarly and professional reports. How can it be that a system that depends on data and numbers cannot see that all these quote unquote isolated incidents and individual stories have been adding up over decades? How is it that the advocacy of black students, their parents, black um, community members, black educators and allies, because there are allies for almost 50 decades, 50 years, sorry, for almost 50 years. How is it that there has been no substantive change? Is this not the result of racism and related sites of oppression? If this is not the result of disregard based upon interests that do not align, if this is not the result of ignoring the voice of black students, parents and community members, then my friends, what exactly is happening? What do you think is happening in Ontario public schools? I leave it there. I thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, that was such a beautiful talk. I hope at some point you can check out the chat and see all of the um, words of thank yous and relations and comments to you, um, although this is not required. So now we will turn over to the, the discussion portion of tonight's talk. Tonight's Q&A or discussion is facilitated by Tai Hoot. Tai is a student in the, in the School of Disability Studies at X University and she's a core member of our Anti-Black Racism Committee. She was born and raised in London, England, and she now resides in Canada with her husband and son, who is a person on the autism spectrum. Ty currently works in the classroom assisting exceptional students at the local school board which to achieve their educational goals and hopes to pivot to educational advocacy sometime in the future. She enjoys learning, skiing, reading science fiction, and playing video games with her son. So as I turn it over to Ty, another reminder to please use the Q&A function to ask your questions. The chat is a bit busy, so we're not, um, we're not attending to it. Um, 
for questions. If you do want to ask a question uh, verbally, just raise your hand or indicate so in the Q&A that you would like to ask Professor Getfield a question. But for now, I'll turn it over to Ty. Thanks, Ty. And thanks, Jackie. Hi, I'm Jackie. I am absolutely um, honoured to be here with you and to listen to your uh, your talk. It has been um, it has been quite moving. Um, as I don't know if you heard uh, the um, my introduction. I have a son who who is on the autism spectrum, so I I completely understand the the issues that um, we have and uh, as black mothers of, of um, children in the school system but um, I, I am very um, impressed with your uh, this isn't something that has um, been brought to light so for readily and so frequently so to, to for you to put this into fruition is just i'm really i'm very impressed and very um enjoying i'm sorry i sorry i'm enjoy i can't wait to see the outcome of your of your research so what i'm going to um do is just read out a couple of the questions and um have you answer them is that okay is that yeah, good job. Okay, so this is um, a question from Rashmi Karnaj Johnny. And um, they say, your presentation and research highlight the similarities of discrimination of medical and education frontline workers. How does this theory translate into actionable items in your work? that can be taken up by community. Yes. Yeah, let me try to answer the question posed by Dr. Rashmi Karnadjani. Oh, Hi, <laughs> um, We have been, when I say we, I mean racialized communities black communities because there's no one black community there's no one asian community um there are many organizations that make up these various um ethnocultural um communities as it were this work is ongoing it has been ongoing it's not something just overnight it, it this did not occur overnight as my talk said so the question is how do communities um, address these, this ongoing racism, these problems within our society, the ableism and all the other, you know, um, sites of oppression? And the question is, how do we move forward despite incremental progress or incremental successes. And we put one foot in front of the other, we mobilize, we get together and we transcend our differences and instead focus on the commonalities so that together we can come up with solutions that will make for more transformative, more long lasting, more sustainable change for not just black students, racialized students, for example. And as Rashmi right, rightly said, not just in education, but in health. The numbers are there to show it. It's, it's, it's we don't have to try and figure out if, if there's racism or there's ableism. If, if there are groups of people that are consistently um, higher in numbers than another group of people, hello. The question is, do we care? Do we care enough? 
And if we care enough, then what are we going to do? Allies and those who are on the receiving end of the racism and, and ableism alike. Everybody has to come together. Thank you. Thank you. And Claudette Brown has a question. What can we do as black women or mothers to address racism and discrimination kind of similar? And how we how can we prepare our children or students for these struggles? Well, as I said before, I'm gonna say it now in one sentence. One hand can clap, okay? <laughs> one hand can clap, we need two. So we need to come together. The one hand can snap, but it is much quieter and it is easily ignored. So when we come together, we have a louder voice, we have more thinking, we can um, effect change in greater ways. But that is, has been the challenge. The challenge has been finding those commonalities, as I said before. The challenge has been, do we dare to put aside our own individual aspirations and to work together for the good of all rather than for individual progress? So that is, one way i forgot the second part of the question could you repeat that for me uh, how can we prepare how can we prepare our children to oh, go out that's an, that's an interesting question mm -hmm. um and i think that we have to call upon the aunties and the uncles in, in other words parents can't do it alone parents have to call upon those whom they trust to have conversations with our children. No, when do we start? I think the earlier the better, but it has to be in age appropriate language. It has to be um, in ways that you can teach, but not scare, not scare children away from thinking, you know, Oh, because of my skin, I can't do anything. And then they, they becomes, it becomes self-defeating. Um, as, as one of my, con, one of my the mothers in, in, in my study said, we have to repair. Every day my son comes home, he tells me the stories. And my response to his stories have to be such that I am repairing the harm. The stories that they are not adequate, the stories that they are subhuman, the stories that they lack, the stories, all those stories they may be given or students may receive. And it's important for there to be a family response, not just parents, you know, um, with my sons, I encourage their uncle, my brother to speak with them. Of course, you know, behind their back. I, 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 I give an, a list of things that I need for him to touch upon um, without them knowing. Um, of course, they are knowing now because they're online and they're listening to me do this talk. So that's not good. Um, <laughs> but, but um, you know, their, their aunties talk with them. And, and because of that, my, my, especially one of my sons, he has a very heightened sense of what is happening in the world and his place in the world. And, you know, he just became a teenager. So it is all being, it is all coming to light. And as we go on, as I said, it has to be age appropriate and it can't be just the parents because after a while, parent, parent voice just doesn't make any sense. Um, I also share with teachers, um, with the educators. I, I work closely with the educators um, to ensure that if they need content, you know, just, 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 just hit me up and I will supply content. Um, but then again, the will has to be there within the schools and, and without going too far in, you know, of segueing to something else, black educators sometimes are scared of having these conversations and, but yet still they are best positioned to have these conversations with students 
and especially black students, but with all students. Um, but sometimes they're scared. They're scared of even saying the R word, you know, and, and so that is part of the problem. So it's, it's a community of persons who need to help students to grapple with what is really happening in their lives. Why are they feeling the way they are feeling? You know, why are they receiving certain treatment from their peers and educators and administrators? Um, so, yeah, I hope I answered the question. Yes, you did. Absolutely. There, the community, building a community and having all the different components working together. So it's, um, I, I have a question that I have um, seen a lot in my work um, is the parents who are tired and they, they, they don't have the, um, the, spirit to fight like they've worked all day and and it's just something that's very difficult for them in in your opinion um and also they they don't feel that the um the system is going to listen to them um in what in your opinion have you encountered um those kinds of situations That's the, that's the, that is the state of affairs. And that's why 45 meetings late, we have to have many meetings. I have to speak with not one person. I have to speak with on one, any one matter. I speak with about maybe three, four persons. Um, and then some people forget, and then you have to remind them. And then we have to plan meetings and then we have to, you know, supply the agenda and then we, and then, and then, and then. And there are many issues happening. Um, and so it is, it is, this, it is very common. And, and again, it, it is a part of the whole, it has to do with power and dominant. Who has the power? Who is the dominant force? If it were the parents, then I wouldn't have to talk so often. I wouldn't have to escalate matters um, outside of the local school and into the district school board. You know, I, I, it, that's not where the power lies. The power, li the power structure is such that although we are said to be partners, it's the farthest thing from the truth. There's no, there's no real partnership, and we are said to have power. Parents are said to have power, but real power. Is different from ideal power. Ideally, we have power. But when it comes down to the everyday interaction, no, there is no power. And power in numbers, I guess, power in community, and power in not just yes, one voice, but, but many. I, I agree that there is greater power in community. But then, Ty, if you think about it, why are we still in the place? Why are we still where we are? Because we have been, as, my, as I mentioned in my talk, we have been having this conversation for decades, for centuries. So if, yeah. there were, if there was true power, why are we still here? Right. Well, uh, I think getting the awareness out there not everybody knows not everybody knows that they have a voice and that they will be listened to so getting the the message out there to parents to mothers to educators is like the well one of the steps so incrementally it's it's moving forward Without being a, you know, I'm, I, I'm definitely not being a pessimist. I've been known to not always see the glass half full. But sometimes you get tired. In this work, you get really, really, really mm -hmm. tired. And, um, and sometimes the incremental just doesn't feel right. It's the everydayness of, of the work that is tiring. 
like I've been I've been wanting not to talk to educators for at least two years now. I, I beg, please don't let me have to talk to you. Please don't let me have to meet. <laughs> because it's just a lot, you know? Right. Yeah. I, I see a question from Lorraine yeah. Lee. Yes. So she says, hi, Jackie. In your study group, were there any notable or tangible individual successes in helping children in their education that may be applicable for future system improvements? Well, although I said that it, it, it is difficult, overall, the numbers show, of course, that Black students are disproportionately failing the system. There are individual pockets of success. And this occurs when there is alignment between the interests, the will of educators and the parents and the students. So it has to be an alignment. When there is friction, then no. Um, it, it doesn't translate into success. And there have been successes without a doubt. There have been successes. But for the success to happen, there has to be alignment. Now, the question is, why wouldn't there be more successes? Why wouldn't there be more successful students? Why is it that Black students and Indigenous students among um, the quote-unquote BIPOC, BIPOC, why are they um, feeling the system more? Well, the, the question was, are there, in your group, the women, I'm, I'm think that, was there any individual successes in helping their children that you found that can be applied um, to like future systems, like uh, educational systems? Where have you found any anything yes, that the about, parents have done? Yes, it is about the alignment of interests. So when the parents' interests align with the educators' interests, yes, there were successes, and but it's pockets of success. So every year. It depends on who the educators are. Parents remain the same, students remain the same, but it depends on who the educators are. So there's no consistency because from, let us say in my experience, um, I think we're on our fourth math teacher since September. Now, that doesn't happen to all parents clearly, um, but that has been my experience and it's not the first year. So with other students, other parents in the study, when there is um, continuity, when there is stability, they will speak of, oh, in grade two, my son had a wonderful teacher and she knew how to deal with him and with his quote unquote behaviors. And so that was a wonderful year. So yes, there are pockets of successes but it depends on the individual teacher rather than, you know, a system-wide approach. It's, I guess it's the same thing as with any profession, you know, doctors, speech and language pathologists or lawyers, you know, it depends on the individual person and, and, and the alignment of the interests. But it's the systemic, it's the systemic approach that is for me troubling because the one-off doesn't make for change, transformational change, like real change, substantive change. That one-off individual here and there, you know, if we get a good teacher, may not get a good teacher, you know, that doesn't bode well in terms for what I would like to see in terms of systemic change for, um, for black students. Right, so he it, individually, right. Um, Shauna Hunt has a question. What would you recommend to the present teacher education program, because this is also a systemic issue, as it relates to curriculum design slash structures? That's a big question, huge question. And that's not a Just question one, that I what one that's not that's not a question oh. that I would I would answer right here, right now. Um, okay. 
there is quite a bit that needs to get done when it comes to teacher education. Um, if I were to choose one thing as you are, you know, urging me to do, teach that pair, teachers must talk to parents. That's number one. Um, put some teeth into parental engagement, parental involvement, and look at it from the perspective of parents. Parents know, they know, but sometimes because of the power structure, because of how traditionally um, educators see parents, they don't view them as having any wealth of knowledge as a community of parents or individually. And so the educator assumes that they know everything and how to fix the child, how to rehabilitate the child. And if you're not careful, even the very IEP consultation notes that the, pa the parent prepares doesn't become a real um, a source of knowledge. And so that's why more than one mother in my study said they don't even understand why they're being asked about the IEP because the IEP does not seem to reflect what they have suggested about their children. And that is because I believe that the educators believe that they know. So that would be the first thing I would say that somehow um, teacher teacher uh, colleges, institutions that train teachers must, must, must encourage teachers to get to know their parents. They must encourage teachers and regardless of, you know, race, phenotypical features, what do you want to call it? Regardless of that, because it's a mindset. Right. It's a mindset. And the pandemic has has if you listen to the ONAPSI um, teacher webinar that was held back in June 2020, it's online, you can Google it. You hear teachers, black teachers talking about how they've had to work with parents. They have had to actually speak with parents because in the beginning, when kids were at home, if you wanted work to be done, especially at a certain age, you know, within a certain age range, you had to mm -hmm. speak with the parents. Then you began to learn more about the kid and how the kid learns. And then as an educator, then you can put your professionalism at work and say, okay, this will work better for this child or, you know, that sort of thing. And then that is how you really um, effect good teaching and, 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 and an optimal learning environment. Great. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We have to wrap it up because the um, uh, the people who is doing the um, signing for us have to leave. Um, but um, I want to thank you again for coming and talking to us. It was wonderful talking to you and you sharing your knowledge with us. And um, I hope that if there's any people that have, to, there's some questions here. So you're going to have access to these questions. And if there's a way that somebody could get in contact with you, if they have any other questions, would that be something you're interested in putting a link in yeah. or your email address into the chat? So if anyone has any other questions, but um, if you would like, um, we're going to wrap it up at the moment. <laughs> yeah, we have we have time constraint. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Once again, I'd like to thank you. And hopefully, um, I'm definitely going to be using your information to contact you because I have a few questions of my own. Um, but if there's anything else that um, Dr. Chandler would like to finish with, then I'm not sure if she is. Hi. Hi. No, um, 
Just echoing your thanks. Thank you, Jackie, for such an informative talk. Um, there's so many comments and questions, so we'll figure out a, a good way to get those to you. Um, thank you, Ty, for a beautiful job facilitating the Q&A. It was wonderful to hear your insights and questions and facilitation skills. Um, thanks to SDS for sponsoring this talk, and thanks to Tally for all of their organizing work, and to Mel and Roman and Angie for the access support. Okay, thank you all, and have a great night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Thank you.